All right. So, yeah, my name is Paul Bain. I'll be talking about crop tree management. Um, and it's essentially, you know, uh, how to uh, how to help your forest grow high quality timber by giving your trees ample room to grow. So crop tree management, <clears throat> it's a widely applicable silvicultural uh, technique used to enhance the performance of your trees. So essentially, you're you're trying to have your selected trees have the most resources uh, to uh, to grow. So why implement crop tree management? About 93 uh, percent of us of the value of a stand is in relatively few crop trees. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, if you think about that, I mean it's uh, you know a small amount of trees that hold the highest value. So you want to manage for those trees. Uh, it's going to assure that the, that the site resources are focused on a small number of selected trees. It allows those, those selected trees to uh, maximize growth potential and to maintain dominance or co-dominance in your forest. And then uh, essentially you get to pick the winners uh, rather than letting you know, Mother Nature choose what trees win, what trees lose. You get to pick the best form trees to grow the best. And then it's, it, it is recommended, this is just kind of a caveat, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, compaction, uh, disease, um, fungus. It's recommended to do a majority of your chainsaw work in the fall or winter, the dormant season. So there's several different methods of crop tree management. Uh, there's crop tree release, uh, which is uh, practiced on a variety of different uh, ages of stands. Uh, there's commercial thinning or an improvement harvest. Uh, weed tree removal, and uh, basal area reduction. And I'll kind of briefly go over all of these. So uh, the first thing you want to do is identify what your crop trees are. Uh, and that depends on what the landowner's goals are. So if you want, uh, if, if you're managing for wildlife uh, habitat primarily, uh, that'll be, you know, you'll choose certain trees uh, versus timber value. Uh, some people uh, manage for aesthetics primarily. Uh, recreation, whether you're hiking or cross-country skiing, um, <clears throat> and or even mushroom production. Uh, but in this talk, I'll primarily talk about uh, wildlife ha habitat and timber value. So if you're managing for wildlife habitat, you're going to want nut or fruit-bearing trees. Um, you want to uh, uh, provide forage for, for the wildlife. And those are walnuts, uh, uh, oaks, hickories, black cherry and apple trees. <clears throat> uh, if you're managing for timber value, uh, right now the desired species are white oak, black walnut, red oak, black cherry, shagbark hickory. As most of you know, black walnut's the most uh, sought after timber uh, tree uh, in, you know, at, the, at the time, but that could change. So um, one thing that I kind of stress to landowners is diversity is good, so it, it, it'll help. So uh, Next, you're going to decide, okay, decide what, what uh, species trees I, I want. Now we're going to have to see what size uh, crop, what size of trees I'm looking at for uh, my crop trees. And generally speaking, you're looking for uh, trees that are 4 to 12 inches in diameter. Uh, they're young, vigorous trees, so they're not suppressed. Uh, and they're in a co or dominant or co-dominant position. So <clears throat> if you look at this little picture I have here, the, the trees with a D, are that hold a dominant position within the canopy. And then the, the net, those are kind of the, the trees that are utilizing the most, uh, they're getting the most sun, sunlight in the forest. Uh, they're, they're what kind of your, your forest is primarily um, noted as. Uh, the C is co-dominant species um, or co-dominant trees. Those are the trees that kind of hold, uh, they, they've got, uh, they kind of hold that secondary position in the canopy, they uh, they share uh, share the canopy with uh, with dominant trees. They may be slightly overtopped, but not too much. Uh, there's intermediate trees like this tree here. Now this tree likely is suppressed um, a, a little bit, but if you were to release it, it may it may have a mild response. And then there's suppressed trees in the understory that would be struggling. If you were to clear around this suppressed tree, if you were to cut these this dominant and co-dominant tree. This tree likely wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't have a, a positive reaction. It, it's it's stunted in its growth. Um, it, it wouldn't uh, end up being a dominant tree. So you're going to want to look at your growth form also. 
So <clears throat> a poor form tree is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a suppressed tree. Uh, it might be crooked, uh, show stressed, uh, which, which would have epicormic branching, uh, sprouting. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show some examples of that as well. There may be uh, multiple stems, uh, which signifies a slightly weaker tree, um, and, and it might have an uneven or thin canopy. So if you're walking out when the trees are fully leafed out, if you notice dieback, that's not a tree that you want to uh, identify as a crop tree. A good form tree is going to be tall, straight, true, meaning it, it's not leaning one way or another or, or uh, uh, significantly leaning. Um, it's healthy and it's got a full canopy. And, and also it's, you know, leaf color is going to be real, you know, uh, pronounced green. It's going to you know, not show signs of dieback. But anyways, here's the, the epicormic sprouting I'm, I'm seeing here. I'm sure everybody's seen this. Uh, this bran branch is kind of leaned over, and it's trying to reach uh, apical dominance. It's trying to get more sunlight, and, and to do that, it's sprouting, sprouting more branches. Here's some canopy dieback that I talked about. As you can see, it's, you know, the top, these branches that aren't leafing out anymore. Um, now, here's a... a a coppiced, uh, so a multi-stem tree. What happened here is the, the, this tree was likely cut or harvested in the past, and you know the uh, coppice sprouting that happened, which is okay, uh, created you know three different trees rather than the one that was there initially. Now, <clears throat> this particular example does have what's called you know it's got kind of a U position. So this is actually you know fairly strong tree. Uh, it's you, there's not any worry or too much worry about this tree splitting down the middle and then and both trees going either way. Uh, if you were to uh, identify this as a crop tree much earlier in its life when it was much smaller, you might have pruned off uh, one or two of these branches, maybe you know selected the best tree and chose that as your crop tree. <clears throat> this tree here is uh, has some epicormic sprouting again. It looks stressed. It's also, it doesn't have a, a, a identified leader. It's kind of got two leaders here. Uh, once again, when this was tree was younger, it would have been good to prune off one side or the other. <clears throat> so here are a couple other defects um, that you can notice in your crop trees. Uh, here's a, a burl on the side of a tree, maybe some, some dead limbs that may open injuries that can uh, introduce rot. <clears throat> uh, maybe there's insect holes or bird peck holes. Uh, you know, if, if a bird's going after something inside the bark, you know, there's a larva infestation. Um, maybe there's knots on the trees. Um, this tree kind of has got a, a sweep in it. Uh, maybe there's cracks from lightning or, uh, <clears throat> or you know, freezing. If there's, if there's mushrooms on the outside, you know, it's not a good, uh, good tree to choose. Also, uh, if, if you're around a property boundary, a lot of times around here at least, uh, we've got a lot of wires and trees and fencing, uh, fencing that's grown into the end of the trees. So here's kind of what you're looking for. Now, now this is a, in a, uh, a planting. Uh, you know, all these trees are tall, straight. Uh, they've likely been pruned or uh, have, have self-pruned their lower branches. Uh, you can see here these full, full canopies, uh, straight tree, you know, you can see that these are going to be, you know, eventual crop or excuse me, harvestable trees. So once again, here's a little bit uh, about the, the form of your trees. You know, I want a single trunk, uh, a defined leader. Uh, you don't have crooks in them. Um, the branches are spaced apart and they generally look healthy. Now, in this example, you know, this tree, you know, to the untrained eye, it might look like a, a crop tree, but it has several codominant stems. Whereas this tree's got the single codominant stem, but it does have some branching that likely would it would benefit from being pruned. Here's another example of, of stems. So then there's when you're selecting a method to uh, to do a crop tree management, uh, there's different stands that you can uh, look in a planted stand there's even aged you know all these trees are relatively the same age uh, around 20 percent the same age uh, as as the other trees in the in the uh, stand as an uneven uneven age stand you would have three or more 
uh, different age groups. So you, you'll have some, some trees regenerating, uh, some dominant trees, and then some in between. So in even age stands, and, and, and all the, in both examples, there's multiple different uh, areas where, excuse me, times when you would do release treatments. So, and this is, you know, kind of the, uh, the biomass um, graph showing, you know, kind of the, not only the tree growth, but also the root growth in an even age stand. And this is a picture taken in, uh, uh, it's actually Mississippi Palisades in Carroll County. Um, this picture was taken in the early 1900s, and you can see that a majority of the timber has been logged. There's not too much left. Uh, I mean, in, in our area, they, you know, this would be an example of an even age stand. You know, all these trees were, were killed at the same time, and they all re-sprouted at the same time. And this is what it looks like now. It's vastly different. And then this is the this is an uh, kind of the same graph, but portraying an uneven age stand. Uh, when when cuttings take place, um, you know the initial reaction is the biomass is reduced and slowly builds up to to when you need to do a harvest again. So here's an example, a picture of a uneven age stand. As you can see, there's there's over or, you know these would be uh, co-dominant trees. Here's a dominant tree. And then there's an understory, a full under, understory. So uh, first management technique I'll talk about is the crop tree release. Um, it's the selective, deliberate uh, removal of an adjacent competing canopy trees. Uh, so you're removing the trees that are directly competing with your selected crown or selected tree. So either the crowns are overtopping, touching, or infringing upon the growth and development of your selected crop tree's crown. So, <clears throat> when identifying your crop trees, you're gonna you're gonna uh, I, or you're gonna select trees that uh, about 20 to 50 trees per acre, and that's uh, dependent on its spacing. So, if uh, if trees are younger, you can select more and then slowly weed those trees out. Um, what you're gonna do is flag the trees that you want to save first. You're going to uh, paint the competing trees that you want to be killed. So in this example, I mean, this is done over a, a picture, but we've selected the circles so indicate your crop trees and the X's indicate trees that are directly competing with that crop tree. And you're, what you're wanting to do is release this crop tree on three to four sides by killing the competing trees. And the goal is ultimately to maximize the sunlight to increase the growth rate. So when you're wanting to release this crop tree on three to four sides, what this means is from an aerial view, you know, here's released on one side and all the way up to four sides. So you want to, once again, maximize that sunlight. Here's a couple, couple more examples, uh, what it would look like, you know, a view from above, from the side. You can see all these competing trees and then subsequent management is, you know, uh, picture. And they can be done at different levels, once again, depending on the size of trees as well as the composition of your forest. So if you have relatively few uh, crop trees, it's not necessary to, necessary to kill everything else, but what you do want to do is open up as much area as you can. So when killing these trees in a crop tree release, you're gonna, there's several methods to do that as well. There's a cut and treat method where you uh, cut it flush with the ground or as close as you can get, and then treat the outer uh, uh, cambium layer with herbicide. Uh, there's girdle and treat, which is this is a double girdle, and then treating with herbicide. Uh, this is a treatment that can be done without herbicide, where you girdle and then remove the bark in between your two girdles. And then hack and squirt method, which is another application of herbicide. Uh, there's a basal bark treatment. <clears throat> where you're putting an oil-based herbicide uh, at the base of the tree to, uh, to kill it eventually. It, it would be killed slower. And then there's a coppice and, or cut and coppice. So if there were desired trees that you're killing, uh, it's not necessarily treat, necessary to treat those with herbicide, but you're kind of starting them over. So maybe they had poor form, uh, they weren't quite as good as, as the crop tree you selected, and you're just going to cut that flush with the ground and let it re-sprout. And as you can see, a lot of times, you know, wildlife will browse on, on these uh, coppice sprouts. 
<clears throat> Another thing that you want to uh, uh, be sure to do uh, with your crop trees is remove the vines. So the vines, you know, they'll choke out and suppress your, your crop trees. Uh, but at the same time, they, some wildlife do find vines beneficial. So different birds will use the vines. Uh, uh, so it's not necessary to cut vines off trees that you, you, know, you, don't, you don't mind if they die anyways. So as long as the crop tree is freed up, it's okay to, to leave some vines on some trees. There's a you know, great poison ivy, bittersweet. Everybody's kind of seen these vines on the trees. And uh, in order to kill them, you, you sever them in two spots and you want to leave them. You don't want, when you cut a vine, you don't want it to be laying, laying on the ground where it could re-sprout. Uh, just cutting it at two spots and, uh, and let it, you know, you could apply herbicide if you like, but use, you've essentially killed that, that vine. Here's a couple of tips for a crop to release. Uh, uh, once again, you want to make sure that you're not scouting for the trees that you want to kill. You want to scout for the trees that your crop trees. Uh, look at the good, not the bad. Um, visual markers are definitely helpful. They're not always used, but uh, it's easy when you're girdling trees to get kind of turned around in the woods. And then the last thing you want to do is start killing your crop trees on accident. Um, <clears throat> it's, in my opinion, better to mark the, the trees that you're going to kill uh, rather than the crop trees just to... Uh, that way you're not you're not con or continuously looking at the paint on the trees um, uh, once again full sun for your uh, crop trees is better than partial so it's okay to release on three sides but generally speaking the more sunlight the better um, and then and then on when that, I was talking about cut and coppicing trees it is okay to cut desirable trees if it's in favor of a better crop tree uh, but you don't have to you don't have to treat it with herbicide. <clears throat> and then when cutting uh, when cutting trees, it's always best to cut lower to the ground. And obviously, you don't want to mess up your chain, uh, dull dull your chain really quickly. So keep it out of the dirt. But and also at the same time, I know from experience, you know your your back can get worn out pretty easily if you're bent over all the time. But you want to you want to cut as low to the ground as you can. And then, of course, always wear PPE, uh, chaps, uh, helmet, hearing protection, and, and eye protection. Uh, n another option that you could use is an improvement harvest. Now, this is generally used when your, your cull trees are of merchantable value. So if you go in and you start noticing you're killing a lot of larger diameter trees, you know, it, it, it'd be better to have somebody else do that for free than to pay somebody to do it, or um, or you know doing it, or, or killing trees that that could be used. So generally speaking, when you do an improvement harvest, you want to focus on the overmature, poor form, defective, uh, dead or dying, or lesser desired species. So you want to make sure the the hackberries, the elms, the uh, the lesser desired timber trees uh, are the trees that you're going to be targeting. Um, the general rule of thumb when marking a harvest is, uh, an improvement harvest, is about 20% of the trees that you, you're selecting for the harvest have to be good trees to entice a, a logger to come and cut it. Uh, if you just mark, you know, kind of junk trees, nobody's going to be interested in, in, in harvesting those trees. There isn't any, any money in it for them. And then you should only do it in, uh, on dry or frozen ground. You want to protect the, the roots. Uh, the soil structure, uh, so that you know the overall stand is improved after the action. <clears throat> so a couple pros to uh, an improvement harvest: uh, you're making money off your lesser desired trees. Uh, you're kind of getting the 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 junk out of your timber. Um, it's it's pot the that opens up possibility to reinvest that money into back onto your property. So not only did you get that, essentially you got that management done for free, but you also might have made money off of it and can then go maybe maybe do a plant, plant in your forest or do management down the line, maybe some invasive species management. Um, <clears throat> you can open, uh, doing that you open up the canopy significantly. Uh, most desired trees are uh, shade intolerant. Uh, the oak regeneration isn't going to come unless there's a gap 
in the canopy for the for the uh, oak to thrive. Uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with promoting desired regeneration. And then uh, having a harvest can also um, implement forest roads onto your property. So those roads can be used for future management. Uh, they, they can be trails. Um, you know, they, they provide access to your property. And then some, some cons to improvement harvest are uh, that herbicide application usually isn't included in the harvest. Uh, some, some crowns may be uh, damaged when felling a trees. Uh, some trees may be scraped. Uh, they may, you know, you may have to go back through after improvement harvest and and do another another cutting. <clears throat> and then, open up the canopy is going to open up the forest resources for the invasive species. So if you have invasive species, you know, in your forest, and you and then you do a harvest, that's what's going to come back. The invasive species, invasive species, and you you must have something to sell. So once again. If there isn't any money out there and you can't, you need to have something to entice loggers to come out and, and, and cut your, your timber. So when things to consider, once again, the invasive species, um, you want to know where the skid trails go. You don't want people to go up and down on some steep slopes, uh, creating, you know, some, some rills or big erosion gullies. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure best management practices are followed. You want to make sure that when taking the lesser desired trees, you're not you're not hurting the the crop trees that you later want to have for your your future crop. Uh, you want to make sure it's done when the ground is dry or frozen. Uh, make sure that you have crop trees left. If you if you take out the best trees or do a high grading, uh, it would be difficult for you know what you're going to be left with is is lesser desired timber, and then. It's important to contact a professional forester just to kind of oversee the entire process. Uh, they'll help you with uh, timber sale contracts, uh, bidding out, uh, maybe do a, a lump sum uh, sale, a sealed bid, so that, to make sure that you know you are getting the best price for your timber. And then a weed tree removal. <clears throat> so a lot of uh, timber that's had a closed canopy for a long time, they have. Uh, ironwood or maple that uh, dominates the the I guess the mid story of your forest. Um, <clears throat> the trees such as you know, like I said, maple, basswood, elm, ironwood, hackberry, mulberry, and once again, this also varies depending on your goals. But uh, but treating you know, you, long story short, you don't want to open up the canopy and let these trees end up being what your entire forest is, is composed of. Um, and then you should herbicide these trees to make sure that doesn't happen also. Um, this is a, an example of an ironwood tree. Um, it does have other uses. I mean, even though it's not a, a good timber or a high-valued timber tree, it can be used for as a mushroom log. Um, it can be used, I mean, it's a very dense wood. Um, so, I mean, it has other uses. Um, bitternut hickory, to an extent, it can, it can take over an understory, but it's not necessarily a, you know, it's, it's an okay, it's a good wildlife species. <clears throat> you can use, you can also use bitternut hickory for, I've, I've talked to people who've used it for uh, smoking meat. Um, they, you know, rather than just cutting everything down and let it lie, you take it out and, and it could have other uses. The last thing I'm going to talk about is a uh, basal area thinning. And what basal area is, it's the, it's essentially the area that your trees occupy in an acre. So, I think I lost it. But <clears throat> it's uh, associated with timber growth, uh, or uh, timber growth and volume also. So, if you, a lot of management that is suggested is based on this, this basal area number. So it does get a little bit scientific. It's, it's tough to figure out over an entire stand uh, unless you use uh, computer programs such as Tiger. But you know, a visual of, of what we're measuring are these dark circles based on this white square. So for those interested, 
uh, the formula for calculating basal area is uh, 0 0.005454 times the dBH squared. And as I said, you know, it's difficult to find that number without baseline inventory data. Uh, I mean, it's, it's tough to go into a, a forest. I mean, you can go into a, a stand and, and identify how much area one particular tree is taking up, and, but it's, tip, it's difficult to do that on a stand-wide basis. Um, but it is, I mean, it is a good number to, to have when, when implementing management. So as I said, it's it's if you were to hire a professional forester or you ha already have a uh, a forest management plan, you can. Oh, so if you already have a forest management plan, this basal area has already been figured, uh, and it's the way that uh, foresters do it is they go out and take a random sample plot inventory and they run it through a program, like I said, such as Tiger or IFIDAP, and, they, th and th that calculates the basal area. Now, the basal area can be further broken down into what's called accept acceptable growing stock or versus unacceptable growing stock. So, obviously, if you have a, a lot of, I guess, junk trees, you know, you may walk out into your, your woods and see See, oh man, that's all I've got. But it, when the numbers are spit out, you realize, well, they're not really taking up that much area. So if I were to take them all out, you know, uh, you you'll have acceptable growing stock left. So here's a a stocking chart that has you know your basal area per acre on the left, and then your trees per acre. So <clears throat> if you had 300 trees per acre. Uh, with a basal area of 100, which was figured in your management plan, you realize that you, you calculate everything out and you're about at a 95% stocking level. So that's, that's, that's pretty highly stocked. I mean, you're not quite up into the overstocked, but things are getting to a point where they're growing at a slower rate. Now, once again, if you had that, uh, that same number and you had it broken down in between acceptable and unacceptable growing stock, you can figure out that if you lower this, you know, if you take out the unacceptable growing stock, your your going to be your stocking level is going to be reduced and thereby increasing the the overall growth rate of your your stand. So in conclusion, uh, there's many different ways to manage your crop trees. Uh, there's the crop tree release, the uh, improvement harvest, weed tree weed tree removal, uh, basal area thinning. Um, and then you can, uh, once again, you can choose the, the to manage for the trees that hold the most value to you. And then uh, you want to be cognizant of what's growing there, not only in the overstory, uh, but in the midstory and understory as well. Uh, increase the light, uh, which would benefit everything that, that you didn't cut. And then my suggestion is to definitely manage against invasive species first. It's always best to take care of an, uh, a problem when it's small, uh, when you open things up and, and the, you realize, oh, all that's coming back is honeysuckle. It is The problem has, uh, has gotten a lot more difficult to, to control. And just uh, some takeaway messages is, is to identify the best, most vigorous trees uh, as your crop trees. And you want to be aware that, okay, they, these trees have plenty of room to grow. Uh, mark your kill trees. Uh, once again, visual cues are, are the easiest way to go about doing this. Uh, if you create at least 15 foot of clearance on three to four sides uh, for crop tree canopies, uh, that should be good for about seven to eight years. You, know, you want to treat your lesser desired trees with herbicide to ensure that they don't come back. You get the desired regeneration that you want. And then once again, 93% of the, of the value of a stand is, in its rel is found in relatively few crop trees. So the question was about uh, invasive species as well as uh, the timing of when to treat them. Um, there are, I mean, that's kind of a, uh, what you should do with, as far as dealing with invasive species is, I mean, if you release, uh, the reason why they're invasive species, I guess, is because they do grow so much faster than everything else. So releasing, <clears throat> Rele or opening up resources to the forest floor 
is going to help, like you said, the garlic mustard or the, the honeysuckle or buckthorn or whatever just flourish. So, I mean, monitoring is the most important thing you can do. Just walk through your woods and, and you want to kind of nip everything in the bud. As soon as you see some garlic mustard coming in, then try to pull it or spray it, uh, you know, get rid of it as quickly as possible before it becomes a bigger issue. And it's always going to be an issue because it's, it's you know, seed is carried by birds. Um, they're going to they're gonna drop them on your property and they're going to persist. But if you catch it early, you'll have less of a problem to deal with. And then as far as the timing goes, um, you want to kind of hit the, if you're going to do a foliar application, you want to hit the, hit the invasive species when they're at their weakest. So when they've kind of um, used as much of their resources as possible. Uh, the example of garlic mustard, uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as the, uh, the buds start to form on garlic mustard, if you spray it, they've kind of used a lot of their resources to uh, form those flowers or the buds to flower out, and, and they ha but they're not, uh, their seed isn't viable yet. <clears throat> so if you spray them with herbicide right at that time, that's the best time to kill it. And uh, uh, hopefully, and I know that everybody's kind of walked through a garlic mustard patch, and it sounds like a, a, a rain stick. You can hear all the seeds flying around. And the seed is, is good for five to seven years, or is viable for five to seven years. So, I mean, you know, it's an uphill battle, but, you know, it's, uh, it's worth, you know, worth fighting. The question was about uh, clarification on the 15 feet of clearance. Uh, that would be in an in a uh, <clears throat> in a uneven aged uh, established forest. So in plantings, that's not necessary. I mean, if if you can monitor your trees and make sure that they they're not encro the branches aren't encroaching on each other, uh, uh, they're not you know inhibiting growth. That's really what you want. I mean, you you want your trees to get as much light as possible. So. I mean, if you're, if you, if you have the ability to go back through a planting, you know, every year, I mean, you can, every, yeah, every, okay, yeah, every five years, then you'll be fine with, with uh, just freeing it up, maybe, maybe three foot of clearance on either side. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's on a case by case basis. I mean, if you can, if, you, if your trees are, I mean, if they, they're kind of stagnant sitting there, and if you can kill uh, some undesired uh, species, if now if you're if you you've got 18-inch oaks next to each other, I mean, a, a, you know, a, a a harvest you don't have to kill or you know kill or uh, get rid of all your oaks, but just selecting the few that that have value, uh, I mean, yeah. it'll it'll benefit you know you and as well as your forest. But at the same time. I mean, if it's it's got to be done when the the soil is hard and and you're not going to have any root damage. As soon as the sap the sap starts flowing, so I mean, if if everything's pushing up, um, now right now, I mean, this is probably towards the tail end, uh, but uh, if you know if you double girdle it, uh, and you know if you double girdle a tree now, it definitely would suppress it a little bit. So it might not completely kill it, but you've you've kind of you hurt it a little bit. Yeah, with herbicide treatment, that's that's once the the sap starts flowing, it'll just kind of push that that herbicide out of the vascular system, and it won't do do the job. Uh, I would use a an oil based herbicide. So um, and and, the, and that kind of depends. You know, you don't want to get something depends on the stand you're in. If you're working near walnuts and you use something like Toradon. Uh, it can, you know, it can have some, uh, uh, so it can kill neighboring trees. So you don't want to, if you use kind of a less, uh, I guess, caustic uh, uh, herbicide, uh, oil-based herbicide like a, a, a triglyper herbicide, and you use it in a dormant season, the effects would be minimized. You, you, you yes, to get to ensure kill. So if you double girdle or I mean single girdling is okay too, but what I would do what I do is double girdle and then I treat the 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 lower girdle. 
Uh, I mean, you can use prescribed fire with any of them. I mean, it, the only with a uh, an improvement harvest, you're going to have larger debris on the ground. It's going to be you know difficult for fire to carry through. Uh, but I mean, you could use any of the any of the techniques with it. All right. Well, thank you.